Uh, a few months ago, uh, I did a set of devotions on some mountains and finding God on those mountains. Uh, and so as a natural continuation, I thought I'd do a set of devotions on valleys instead. I reckon Steve and Al would be quite happy about that, coming from valleys themselves. Um, so yes, a week of valleys. Imagine what we could do if we didn't let fear stop us. Today's valley is the Valley of Eshkol, found in Numbers 13. I'm going to read Numbers 13, 17 to 31. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruits of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as the Rehob toward Labo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where Ahiman, Sheshai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And when they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. And at the end of the forty days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and their cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amekalites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take the land, for we certainly can do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people, they are stronger than we are. Quite a long passage. But by this point, the Israelites, they'd left Egypt. They've now got their rules for how to live as a community. They've got their laws for how to live with God. And they're making their way to the promised land. And they've gotten to the edge and God tells them, yeah, scout out the land. A few weeks ago, I was invited to go ape the treetop climbing experience. And just a quick thing to mention, I am terrified of heights. Uh, anything over 150 metres in the air, I'm fine. Uh, but up to that point, I'm terrified. And I've been climbing before, but normally I would reach a point on the course, get to one particular obstacle and just stop. I wouldn't get past my fear. My fear would stop me in one place. Whereas this time, I went and when I got to an obstacle that I really hated because I was looking down and, and I'm terrified of heights, instead, I pushed through. And with the rest of the group, we all pushed on together. And as a result, I got to go down the zip line at the end, which was absolutely worth it. The Valley of Eshkol, where the Israelites cut off the cluster of grapes, that's... That's the zip line in this scenario. It is a sign of God's goodness. It's a sign that God had provided for them. It was land flowing with milk and honey. God had taken them to a beautiful, fertile land, and this valley showed how much God was taking care of them. But the Israelites, in their fear, ignored it. They let fear stop them. And as a result, they turn away from God and wander the desert for another 40 years. 
Imagine what we could do if we didn't let fear stop us. When I was on that treetop adventure, I was afraid because I kept looking down at the ground. I kept looking at the bits that would go wrong, the, the bits that were scary. I didn't trust in my harness and I didn't look at the zip line, the, the good fruits that reward. And the Israelites, I believe, were the same. They were afraid because they kept looking at the giants in the land and the strong fortresses and the massive people rather than focusing on the fruits and trusting in God. I wonder if we are going to make the same mistake. Many of us will be going through tough patches right now where we question God's goodness, where all we can see are the problems because, understandably, we've got problems that are massive and really do matter. Uncle Iroh from Avatar The Last Airbender, which is an incredible series, by the way, says, if you look for the light, you can often find it. But if you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see. Our problems exist. You don't need me to tell you that. We live in an imperfect world. But as the theme with Joseph has been in our Sunday morning services, we have an attitude, we have a choice of how we react to that. When there is darkness in our world, is that the only thing we're going to look for? Or are we going to look for the light as well? Will we look for the fruits of the valley of Eshkol? Or will we look at the giants instead? Imagine what we could do if we didn't let fear stop us. Let's pray. Father God, we've got real problems in this world that are scary to us and make us afraid. We all do. But Lord, you are good no matter our circumstances. Even in the darkest valley, you're still there. And Father God, I pray that you'd give us the strength to look for the good in the world rather than look for the bad. To look at the light in our lives rather than the darkness. And when we do come to darkness, Lord, you'd give us the strength to get through it. In the name of your Son, Lord. Amen. See you guys tomorrow. I shall not want